Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guests are Larry Scheich, Associate Dean of Natural Sciences and Professor of Chemistry, and Tim Flood, Professor of Geology at St. Norbert. We're going to discuss their new home, the Gail Mulva Science Center on St. Norbert College campus. Guys, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, before we get started on this and the exciting uh, uh, building that we have, I want to talk a little bit about uh, you guys and what you've been doing. So first of all, how long have each of you been here? Um, coming up on year 33. Year 33, yep. wow. Came here right out of grad school, teaching chemistry here. and been associate dean for going on eight years. And eight years. And you're a former associate dean. I'm a former associate dean. I will be starting my 29th year. And when I arrived in 1987, they had never had a geology course taught, nor the multitude of rocks that clutter up the building. There wasn't a rock <laughs> on, in the building. So that's my fame. <laughs> yeah. yeah we're, actually, I want to ask you a little bit more about your rocks uh, later on. Um, but how did you guys get involved with the Gail Mulva process? I mean, let's talk about how long ago was that? That actually started about 1999 or 2000, um, and it actually had to do with the hire. I was in Larry's position at that time, and they were hiring a new position in chemistry, and I came in on the weekend, and was it you and Tammy Melton, or was it you and, and somebody else? And Dave Klopotic. Two of our former uh, chemistry professors here. Correct. And they were scraping the ceiling in the chemistry lab, getting the chipped paint off because they didn't want to lose a candidate because the facilities were so poor. Wow. And so here we had, you know, senior faculty, you know, scrubbing ceilings and repainting them on weekends just to get by. So then when Bill Hines came, um, President Bill Hines. President Bill Hines, sorry. When when President Hines came, what I did is I arranged a tour of the building almost immediately and said, we need a new science building. Look what we're doing here. And I told them the story of our senior chemists, you know, buffing up the room before they did a hire. And so that was sort of the, the general start of it, at least from my end of it. And yeah, so I got involved in the project shortly thereafter. Um, Tim did an inventory of the building of all the things that worked and didn't. And the list of things that didn't work were probably about as long as the list of things that did. And we got the okay from President Hines to approach Project Kaleidoscope or PCAL and went to our first PCAL meeting in January of 2000 to start the planning process. Yeah, tell, us a little, <coughs> little bit of, tell us a little bit about Project Kaleidoscope. What, what's that all about? Um, PCAL, they help, it's a nonprofit that helps design science buildings. Their focus is um, just on science buildings, building that will function well for students with sort of the learning objectives in place. And their philosophy is that you design the program first and then you build the building once you've defined the program. And it was interesting, the first meeting we went to, we had to build a little poster and sort of, who are we, why do we need a new science building? And one of the lines that we had on there is we don't have a women's bathroom on the chemistry floor. And um, the story goes back, the, the old building, the original building was built in 1969. Why would you need a woman's bathroom on the chemistry floor? That was actually the story. Wow. And so people remembered us from the meeting, they didn't remember us, but are you the school that doesn't have a women's bathroom <laughs> on the chemistry floor? And that's how, that's how we got known. And that's actually amazing because we were co-ed way early on mm -hmm. for a Catholic institution. I think is in the 50s, if I'm not mistaken. So that, But they just weren't expected to study science, right? No, the, no. the philosophy at the time was that the sciences, in particular the, the, light, the hard sciences like chemistry as opposed to life sciences, were male-dominated. Yeah, well, th things certainly have changed, you know. Yes, they have. So St. Norbert's been around for 117 years, right? And we've been teaching science almost since the very beginning. So uh, talk a little bit about, if we go back to, say, you know, 1900 or something like that. Um, not that you guys were around. <laughs> <laughs> almost. <laughs> almost, yeah, I know, I feel the same way. Um, but uh, talk a little bit about what science was like here. Who was teaching it? Who were the students? What were they doing? What were the subjects? What did science look like on a liberal arts campus in 1900? Well, in chemistry, originally the labs and things were, from my understanding, were in the basement of Boyle Hall. And then they eventually moved to old Army surplus Quonset huts up near the river, and that was sort of the home of chemistry, physics, biology before the John Minahan Science Building was built. In 69. 
Yep. Wow. So I, I'm not sure how long they were in Quonset huts, but they were, I've heard lots of stories from alums about having all their chemistry labs and biology labs in the Quonset huts. And, and much of the science was taught by Norbert Teens, and a couple of the ones that I remember are his father Pritzel in chemistry, father Keefe in biology. biology. And there's a great story about father Pritzel, by the way, just to give you an idea of how times have changed, we interact with students. Uh, Ramon Bisque told me this story when he took, he was an alum from the college in, uh, in the 50s, late 50s. Father uh, Pritzel came into class, looked at the roster. He was one seat short, so he looked around the room and he said, you, you're no longer a chemistry major. Go find something else. <laughs> he threw him out of the room. Right? And the guy left. He was never a chemistry major thereafter. So, yeah, the times have changed a little bit in terms of the interactions. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, just the way that, uh, you know, young people approach the college decision and the major decision has become not only an art form, but an entire business where, you know, they hire consultants to help them with their test scores and all yeah. that sort of thing. It's, it's pretty, pretty crazy. Um, and so uh, you mentioned Norbertine. One of the Norbertines you mentioned was uh, Father Anselm Keefe, who I think became dean of the college at one point, right? Yes. Yes. So uh, talk about him. You know, he was he's sort of a looming figure in our history. Well, I mean, he has his fingerprints all over sort of the history of the sciences in the college. Um, he was a priest in the war. He, you know, did studies of mosquitoes and other malaria um, well, mosquitoes that carry malaria. He was a botanist. We have his botany collection, which the last time he cataloged it had 60 some thousand specimens. And there's boxes and boxes of them that haven't been cataloged since he left. Um, so he was very um, prolific in all the things that he did and laid a real solid foundation for not just biology, but the sciences at the college. Well, let's talk about that collection a little bit. I've heard some stories about how he went about collecting. It's literally samples from all over the world, right? It is. Okay. Yep. So talk a little bit about, first of all, did he go all over the world to get these? And I mean, that'd be kind of fun to take a plane to you know Hawaii to get a flower. Well, in the time he was collecting, travel all over the world would not have been easy. <laughs> yeah. So no, we have boxes of letters of correspondence of his to people throughout the world asking to trade samples. So he would get samples from South America or samples from Europe and send them samples from North America. So he has samples from um, all over the world. There are some samples from you know, South America. There are some samples that were collected originally before he was even here, the early 1800s, that people sent to him from their collection. So it's a very large collection that needs to be cataloged, but we haven't found the way to do that yet. But in the science building, in the new science building, there's a separate room set aside for his collection, his botany collection. We have his original microscope that mm -hmm. he worked with, lots of the artifacts from him. So there's a room dedicated to him, and the science gallery is named for Keefe as well. Can you imagine? I'll trade you a dandelion for a cactus. You know, that's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think he made a lot of his contacts in the <clears throat> Army, but the 60,000 right. that are cataloged are scientifically cataloged. So he had to, by hand, describe these specimens as best he could, and so we've got all those, yeah. That's pretty cool. And it's mostly, is it uh, like insects and stuff like that too? No, this is, is all, the, the, bot, the, the entomology collection is from a different Norbertine. That was from Van, Father Van de Haan. Oh, so, really? Yeah. And that's fairly extensive as well, is that right? Yeah, it's not nearly as large as the Keefe Botany Collection, but there's a fairly large uh, collection of butterflies and other insects as well. Which is, you know, pretty interesting because, I mean, I'm not sure that that's the kind of thing that we think about when we do science now is just the, the collection phase. If um, you've ever had an opportunity to go to, I think it's Harvard's Museum mm -hmm. of Natural Science, which is a really cool thing. And partly because it captures in time, I think, around the turn of the century or maybe in the late 19th century, a lot of science and biology was going to exotic places, killing something, stuffing it, and putting it in a case. Yes. Right, right, right. Yeah, which is not correct. not the way we do things now. Well, if you're a geologist, it's the way we do things now, right? We don't kill rocks. <laughs> right? We don't kill rocks. <laughs> well, was geology really much of a, of um, its own science uh, in the early part of the 20th century? Yeah, uh, geology really got developed as a major science in the the late 1800s, and actually some of the more prominent ones came from UW Madison. Oh, really? Chandler uh, was one, and Lyle, not Lyle, he was from Scotland. Chandler in particular was one from Madison, ultimately became the provost at Madison. Um, but it was pretty well established. Um, but it really significantly involved in the 20th century with the advance in technology, particularly after World War II. Yeah, especially after World War II. And um, I think one of the things that 
that people of a certain vintage of which we qualify, remember, was uh, you know the space program here in the mm -hmm. U.S. and the push for science because you know the Russians mm -hmm. were going to beat us. You know, we, we had stolen half of the German science, uh, scientists mm -hmm. and the, the Russians got the, the other half and um, we were competing, right? And actually, the Minahan Science Building, our, our, you know, the old version of this, that was sort of an artifact of that space program era. Is that oh, right? Oh, it certainly is. I mean, it's a typical um, sort of Cold War science building construction. I mean, you can go to campuses all over the country mm -hmm. and you see buildings that look very much like it. In fact, I was at a conference at, I think it was UW... Um, Eau Claire, and their science building is exactly like ours. I mean, you can, you can walk the same, the stairs look the same, you can walk through the building and it looks exactly like the building. But they're all built that same style, the very narrow slit windows because you didn't want people to see what you were doing because yep, science yep. was had to be private so that the Russians wouldn't steal all of our secrets. And So yeah, it, it's typical of that era. Which is which is amazing. I mean, very it was very functional rather than... Uh, uh, architecturally beautiful, right? Oh, I mean, yes. yeah. And uh, not only that, but a lot of schools were just struggling in the 60s to, uh, uh, higher education was struggling to accommodate all the people that were that were there. Right. Yeah. I mean, they, they were bursting at the seams and there were, you know, the U.S. was prosperous and that was an important place to, to put money, right? But not a lot of science buildings were built, though, in the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s in there, right? No, there was that sort of big push after, you know, the war, that lasted until probably the 70s or so, and then it really tended to slow down. And then a, sort of a new wave in the mid to late 90s and then pushing into the 2000s. So how did teaching science at a college level, especially uh, you know liberal arts college, how did that change from the time that we planned uh, JMS, the Minahan Science Building, till, till now? How's it changed? What are the big differences? Well, I think the big change, twofold, one is technology. Um, you, now we've got smart classrooms all over the place. We have access to the videos. We've got access to state-of-the-art equipment to do some of our student faculty research we'll probably talk about later. And then the second thing was there was a significant approach to how do you teach, to student, to student learning, if you will. And so now we have flipped classrooms where in some areas, not so much in the sciences, but a little bit where we let the students basically lead the conversation very different than in the 60s, true stories here in the 70s, the professor would be at the board with a cigarette in his mouth and chalk in the other hand. And that's how, that's how science was delivered then. But very, very different delivery system, even since I've been here in the last 30 years. I mean, it used to be, I mean, I majored in science as an undergraduate too, and you sat in a big lecture hall, mm -hmm. and you copied down the pearls of wisdom as they dripped from the lips of the professor in the front, and uh, maybe if you were lucky, you sort of had access to a small discussion group. All right. Yeah, you know, yeah. and that's not the way we do it anymore. In fact, no. I think uh, in the new building, we've done away with the giant lecture halls, right? We have. Yeah. The, when the building was built, the traditional model was lecture. You know, you stand and you talk at the students, and they just listen. And the new models are all moving towards the students need to be much more engaged. And all yeah. the data shows they're much more successful if they're engaged in their own education. So yeah, the, the science building, the largest classroom seats 88, but other than that, there's nothing that seats more than 40, because even in the time I've been here, we've never had lectures you know, of 100 or 200. Even though we had a, a lecture pit that would hold 300 students, we've never had classes that large. And we're moving away from our goal is to have everything under 40. Um, so that's a big change, is having much more student-faculty interaction, and the whole student-faculty research piece as well. You know, the, most of the research labs in the old John Minahan Science Building were these really small rooms where one faculty member could fit because they would do their research and the students would never be involved. And now the, the key is to get students involved in research early on, so building spaces so the students can participate in, in research with faculty, not just have faculty. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> I would imagine that that is. So uh, let's talk a little bit about now about some of the, the unique spaces that are in that in the building. Okay, you talked a little bit about some of the student uh, the student gathering spaces, but there, there's some other kind of cool spots. Talk talk about what's in there that makes makes that building distinctive as a science building. I think one of the the big features are all the student faculty research spaces. In the old building, there were three rooms specifically designed for student faculty research. They were all in chemistry for whatever reason. But now I think there are 17 or 18. Every discipline has at least two or three, and most disciplines have more than that. So there are these spaces where students are encouraged to engage in research even early on. We have some summer students this year who have just finished their freshman year who are doing research in chemistry. 
So that's, I think, one of the, the most unique features. There's also the classrooms are set up for sort of modern pedagogy. The furniture's very movable, can be rearranged. The students can work in groups much more easily. You know, if you were in the old lecture pitch with the tablet arms, you can't have students work together. If you were at, in rooms with had tables, you could, but you know, it's a hassle to drag the chairs around or try to move the tables, and some of the tables were fixed. So almost all the rooms have very movable, flexible furniture, so you can easily transition even within an even class period from I'm gonna lecture for a while, now let's go and work in small groups, let's come back and talk about things. So the rooms are all designed to be flexible in terms of how you can interact with students and you can just change quickly on the fly. So it's not, okay, today is lecture, tomorrow's group projects, you can do that all in a, in a given period. Yeah, I think another unique space is we have a museum, science museum, and it's just off the atrium, and it serves two purposes. One. Uh, faculty can set up displays of the work they're doing or, or their research interests, stuff like that, but it serves as a great outreach center. So we'll be bringing grade school kids in, probably high school kids, other civic groups in to the museum and we can do demonstrations and, and some pretty significant outreach there. I mean, that's really important now, especially given the Norbertine uh, sense of community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, science has uh, become less and less popular in some ways in the U.S. Um, it's not as cool as it was in the 60s when everybody wanted to be an astronaut. Okay, right. now everyone wants yep. to be Kim Kardashian, I think, is, which is <laughs> unfortunate. <laughs> so uh, that kind of outreach, getting people involved, mm -hmm. reaching millennials where they are is, is really important, and that's, that's definitely reflected in, in what we did. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the folks who, who help support this. Okay, um, you know, uh, the Gales and the Mulvas were incredibly generous, and I mean, this doesn't happen without them. Mm -hmm. Not that you would speak for them, but why is it with all of these different things that people can put their money into, why is it that this was worth it? You know, you've spoken to them, both of you. I mean, what, what's your sense about why it is that the folks like that are that interested in supporting something like that here? I'll take first shot at it. I, first, I think they have a great love of the college. And, they, and they've been great friends of the college, great supporters of the college. And then secondly, and I think Larry has done a lot of the, the stewardship in this, I think they recognize that we have a, a pretty good science faculty, a dynamic science faculty with lots and lots of potential, and that their investment wasn't just into the building, it was into the faculty and hence into the students. And I think they saw that connection. And I think if, if we didn't have you know, Larry's leadership on this, pointing out that, hey, we have some really, really good faculty here, and we're going to use this building, and we're going to teach our students. It might not have happened, but it goes back to their love of the college would be my, my first basic take on, on, on why they were so generous. And I think the majority of them recognize the importance of science, and not just science for the science students, because we do teach non-science students as well. Every student it who graduates from has here to has to have course, science. Yeah. Yeah. So I think a number of them recognize, or most of them recognize, the importance of having all the students have some exposure to the sciences and having a good facility where you can interact with the students because it's really the non-majors as much or more so than the majors that benefit by having that sort of close tie with the faculty, being able to do things that are more hands-on in the classroom as opposed to, you know, in years past, you'd have non-science majors sitting in a big classroom you just talk at them for, you know, three or four hours a week and they'd glaze over after 10 minutes. So it's, a, it's an attempt to get them more involved because having Students who aren't science majors still understand how science works, how technology works, because it's a huge part of everyone's life. Yeah, yeah. And even if you don't really see it or people don't see it, it really does impact lots of things that they do. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially you know, with the discourse in modern media, I mean, you hear a lot of stuff that <clears throat> is kind of half reported or not quite accurate. To be a critical thinker about this stuff is really important about to be a citizen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I could back up in the timeline a little bit, and maybe Larry will tell the story. There was a downtime, at least morale-wise, when we started doing the planning and we didn't see any, any um, projection of when we actually might start in the mm -hmm. construction. And you want to tell the story about the gift that came out of the blue? That Yeah, I got a call from <clears throat> the advancement office one day. We want to get all the faculty together. It's like, when? How about now? It's like, oh, how about in about an hour? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so we all got together and had no idea what it was. Well, um, Dr. Mark Stinsky, who took a cold call from Advancement, had never really given a lot of money to the college before, um, and they called him just cold call and, you know, 
said, well, here are a list of things you give money for. And you know, there's some things for a few hundred dollars, some for a couple thousand. And because they were trying to get the science building going, they always threw in, well, you know, in planning for the science building, which was, you know, $250,000, $275,000, he said, oh, I'll do that one. It's like, okay. <laughs> so he just agreed <laughs> to God give the money. Like no, that. I mean, so oh my he, God. he, he had Keefe as an instructor. He, his entire career in science was motivated by his interactions with Father Keefe. So he decided this was something that he really thought was important. So he gave the gift, and that then got us to the point yep. where instead of talking about it, we could hire the architects to then actually start the design process. And then that kicked off the process so we could start designing. People got re-energized that, well, now this is really moving forward. We can actually start doing this. And then it just sort of built from there. It built momentum. The board started to recognize the importance of the project, how significant it would be for the college as a whole, and eventually people bought in. And that original architect then mm -hmm. put, put schematics together that you could take out and show the board, say, this is what we think it might look like, and this is no. what the interior might look like. And that was a, that was a huge step for it us. Was. That programming step, that gift that allowed us to do the was. programming was huge. Unfortunately, the timing on that was just as the economy started to become unglued. Yes. And, I mean, philanthropy in general got hurt, you know, et cetera. And, and, but yet, you know, uh, especially with the President Tom Kunkel, who, you know, is amazing at communicating why mm -hmm. this stuff is important. We got the gifts that we needed to get started. We, we don't build anything here until we have, essentially the money is largely in hand. We don't want to borrow a lot of money to do projects, which I think is very prudent. So we get to the groundbreaking. Okay, do you remember that? Do you remember the, mm -hmm. when that was? Yeah, um, I think it was March of two years ago. Mm -hmm. I also remember it was cold and windy. Yeah, I do remember cold and windy. miserable <laughs> outside. Yeah. Yep. But what, I mean, so that was, you know, March of 2012 when the project, I mean, 13 years 13, into the project. 2013. What, 2013. Yep. So what, I mean, what, what was going through your heads as, as you know, the, the golden shovels and the whole nine years? I mean, the symbolism oh. is really important. It what, is. What were you thinking? But I, I still, <laughs> I still wasn't sure that it was really going to happen. I mean, it, it had been going for so long and it's such a huge project. You know, but it's like, okay, this is a sign that we really are going to start moving. And from there, it's just a whirlwind of supposedly a two-year project, but they were done early. And, you know, but that, yeah, it was, it was nice to actually see that happen where you could say to yourself, I guess this really is going to take place. You know, we're going to get this done. It's going to benefit not just the science, but the college as a whole. And there are lots of people that are supportive of what we're trying to do here. Yeah, I was going to guess that you were going to say, holy cow, do I have a lot of work to do in the next couple of years. <laughs> well, that, well, that, was, that was the yeah. other thing, yeah. yeah. But, you know, it, 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 well, not for me. That was for you. You were doing all that work. But one of the things when we went to PCALS, they said you needed to have a shepherd for the project, someone from the faculty. And it should be a half-time position, essentially. So Larry's been doing about two and a half positions here mm -hmm. for the last couple of years running the building. Um, but it was an immense amount of work to do that. For myself, I just thought, hey, I can take my students outside. I do geology, <laughs> put on an extra pair of gloves or something like that. But, I, but it was amongst the faculty, there was a lot of concern. How do we teach chemistry labs, biology labs? How do we deliver quality education when there's all this racket of construction going outside? Yeah, how did we do that? I mean, what was the, what was the plan here? Well, that was a whole other level of planning process is to sit down and figure out what we had to teach, what spaces had to have particular types of labs. I mean, chemistry labs you can't teach just anywhere. You still had to have places with hoods and, and all the rest. You know, geology is a little more flexible because you don't have to be in a room that has, you know, the same right. ventilation needs as chemistry. Right. Rocks don't move themselves. They don't, no. <laughs> no. Uh, and it was a challenge for the contractors as well because they would have preferred to have done the project all at once. But you can't because we had to have a place to teach science. So it was putting the puzzle together of here are all the things we need, here are the spaces that are still going to be available. Let's try to cobble together a schedule of how we're going to do this. And the faculty were all very good about being accommodating. I mean, for, for both years, phase one and phase two, phase one, we were in half of the old building. Phase two, we were in half of the new building. But we were teaching labs in places we wouldn't normally be teaching them. You know, chemistry, was, chemistry and biology were sharing a lab for that first year. And between the two sections, there are probably 10, 11, 12 lab sections. So people had to agree, okay, I'm going to teach a lab at 8 o'clock in the morning or I'm going to teach a lab late at night. I had a gen chem lab that ran until 8 o'clock on Monday nights and we had labs running late every night and people were just willing to do it because you could see what the benefit was going to be down the road. But for two years, it was putting the pieces together about who's teaching when, how to get all the parts together, where are people going to teach. We also had to move people into PAC for their research space, which yeah, was a whole other challenge. The old Norwich well, High School. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was a whole other challenge, finding research space for people because we have a fairly large number of young faculty 
who really couldn't afford to take eight, two years out of their research agenda to let the building build. So that was a lot of moving pieces, but people were good about making accommodations and finding ways to make it work. And a lot of creativity and cooperation and evolving of, of the process. There was talk about bringing in tech trailers to do the biology chemistry labs. Maybe some of the labs could be taught at local high schools. Maybe we could share with UWGB if we had to and bust them out there. But folks were creative, they worked through it, they were flexible, and it, it was a bit inconvenient at times, mm -hmm. but it's certainly worthwhile. Well, the thing that I made an impression on me is that, I mean, there was a fair amount of uh, demolition work that needed to get done, <laughs> and you can't really do that <laughs> when classes are in session next door. Uh, this studio used to be in that building, yep. and um, I, it was right after uh, Pope Francis was uh, had, had become Pope, and I was interviewing one of our uh, faculty here, Tom Bolin, and literally, there were jackhammers going yep. on right outside of the studio. And I'll, I'll say, uh, Dr. Boland was a trooper. He was just plowing right <laughs> through it. <laughs> and uh, you know, some of our sound people were incredible at meeting, uh, managing to keep that off of there. But that, that was pretty tough. So we get to the dedication, which was a couple months ago, a few mm -hmm. months ago, right? May. Yep. And uh, I mean, that was quite the to-do. I mean, there was like a, a musical composition mm -hmm. that was written and performed for it, et cetera. Um, talk about what was going through your heads then, other than just, wow, what am I going to do with all this extra time? Actually, that, that was not my thought. <laughs> yeah. my, my first thought was, it's actually done. You know, and, and you just walk through the building and see what it looks like. And, and it's, I think it turned out better than I think we even envisioned that it might. Now that the whole building's done, you can walk through the whole building. It's an incredible space. And the students are always in it, which to me is rewarding because that's what we wanted mm -hmm. for the students not just to come to the lecture and lab and go home but to come and actually stay there know the other students get to know the faculty and just learn to work together because they're going to have to when they get out and i think for me when i was there i remember reminiscing about the weekend i saw the chemists taking paint chips <laughs> off the ceiling and painting it when they brought in a candidate and i thought about our first pcal meeting and i thought about the whole process and how we had finally reached this end of this long journey. And thinking, knowing what I know now, I probably would never have gotten involved. <laughs> <laughs> you would have just picked up a paint brush and maybe done a, it. Yeah. Well, you know, in the end, our, the most important legacy that any of us who are here have are the students that right. can come yes. here. And, you know, um, as I've gotten farther along in my career and I've seen some of the folks that I've taught get into their careers, et cetera, it's, it's incredibly rewarding. And that's, of course, first. But you can't help but feel a certain sense of pride that what you guys have done is making a contribution to this, to truly a historical contribution to this campus. And, you know, like I say, that building is going to be around probably 50 to 75 years. And, you know, people who are your grandkids' age are probably going to be, uh, you know, complaining about scraping uh, the paint and talking about those old hoods. But for now, it's an absolutely fantastic facility. Thanks for what you guys did for that. So what's next? More rocks, I'm guessing? Well, I can tell you, for, on a personal level, yeah. one of the things that came with a new building is some new equipment. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a geochemist. I study volcanoes, do geochemistry. And I've been running the Madison, UW Oshkosh, McAllister College, Beloit College, sending samples off. Just for me, for my research, we got a new scanning electron microscope with an energy dispersive system. It sounds big, but what it allows me to do is where I would try and somehow cobble together some funds and travel time to, to take my students other places, I can walk down the hall now and do some mineral chemistry and with my students. So my research quality is going to increase. I hope it does. He wants it to. Um, <laughs> my, my boss here said it better when we bought you this instrument. But no, so I'm excited about that. And I think lots of other folks are excited about some of the equipment that also came with the building. So. Um, yeah, that's for me. That's a big thing. Yeah, we have so many, uh, you know, new faculty here that are yep. eager beavers to to do stuff, and uh, I'm I have a feeling that, you know, as much as St. Norbert has been on the map for you know the the kind of contributions we've made from a research point of view, it's going to be even more in the future. So yeah. unfortunately, uh, go ahead. Yeah, when you look back at what we were doing with what we had, and look at what we have yeah. now, yeah, yeah. you project that forward. There's there'll be some remarkable things happening. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's going to be cool. Thanks for what you've done on behalf of everybody associated with the community. Fortunately, we're out of time, and I hope you've enjoyed our show today. Until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College.